Hey everyone, it's Madame Berry. In today's video, we're gonna go over the features of Clip Studio Paint from a beginner's point of view. This video will tell you how to start a new document and work with the interface of the program. If you've just downloaded Clip Studio for the first time, this video is perfect for you. I've been doing all of my digital art for the past few months in Clip Studio Paint, and it's one of the most robust painting programs I've ever used. But it can be a little overwhelming at first glance. So my aim for today is to help you distinguish which parts of Clip Studio's user interface you need to know so that you can get started drawing right away. If this video is helpful to you in any way, let me know by tapping the like button. That'll help push it up in the algorithm, so hopefully it can help more people too. Let's get started. Wait, before we get started, if you haven't checked out my last video where I'm giving away two art prints of Abundance and Stasis and Growth from Within, go check that out. Okay, back to this video. Here's what you see when you first open the Clip Studio Launcher. Up at the top, you'll be able to spot some files that you've worked on recently, if you have any. This lets you open them again quickly. You can see even more recent works by hitting the More button. Underneath that, you'll see some news from Clip Studio. This includes any events going on, as well as patch notes for the Clip Studio updates. The bar at the top lets you log in to your Clip Studio account and displays how much gold and clippy you have. These are currencies used to buy new assets, which I'll show you later. To the sidebar, the most important button is this one at the top. This opens the Paint program. If you need to update this program, you'll see an icon right here. You'll also see this Modeler button, which isn't relevant unless you want to create your own 3D assets, so we're going to ignore it. If you're using the Clip Studio trial, or you haven't yet activated your license, you can buy it or activate your license here. The last really relevant button in the sidebar is this green button under Service that lets you access the Asset Store, which I'll cover later. Let's open Paint. The first thing you probably want to do is start a new document. You do that by hitting File, New, or this button right here. Clip Studio offers a number of different presets depending on if your document is an illustration, a comic, or an animation. For this purpose, we'll just be focusing on illustration projects. You can easily change the size using the presets Clip Studio comes with, or change the width, height, and resolution to a custom size of your choice. I tend to like drawing in A5 or larger. You can also change if Clip Studio will display your project in pixels, millimeters, inches, or some other unit of measurement. This is useful if you need to print your project at a particular size, for instance 8.5 by 11 inches. I tend to keep paper color unchecked so that we can have a transparent background if we need it, and template is used for comic book pages. So we're going to hit cancel on template and then we're gonna hit OK to make a new document of this size. If you're working on your drawing and you decide it needs to be a different size, there are two ways of changing it. The first is under Edit, Change Image Resolution. This will resize your entire artwork and upsample or downsample the image based on its new size. This is useful if you just need to expand or shrink the whole image, but it will change the pixel resolution of your artwork. So for instance, if we change this to 5,000, and it will automatically scale the height based on what I just typed in the width. You can see I'm more than doubling its size. So if you want something to be exactly two times the size, you hit two in scale. And you can see the whole thing grew. You can do the same thing downsampling it. Now it's much smaller. But I did lose a lot of the detail in my brush stroke. The second way to change the size of your document is by going to Edit, Change Canvas Size. This option will let you expand or shrink the working area of your image without changing the pixel resolution of the image itself. Use this if you need to crop your drawing or expand the borders so that you have more room on the side to draw. You can do that by typing in the numbers themselves. or just by dragging this box around to the size that you want it to be. This acts like the crop function in Photoshop. So now you have the canvas and you want to start drawing. Mark making tools in Clip Studio are split up into a few different categories and it can seem kind of confusing when you first look at it. 
Unlike Photoshop, where most brushes are stored under one tool and they can be organized into folders, Clip Studio stores them in subtool tabs. By default, it includes a pen and marker tool, a pencil and pastel tool, a brush tool that includes watercolor, realistic watercolor, thick paint, and India ink, an airbrush tool, an effects tool that has many different options, and blending tools. So you can see that even though I'm clicking the icons on the sidebar, they actually have many different sub options in between that. And then once you've clicked your subtool, the actual brushes are organized underneath that. You can move subtools to the toolbar or to other subtools. So you can organize these in any way that makes sense to you. Mine are kind of a mess. My advice would be to look through all of these different tool options and look through the subtools that Clip Studio Paint comes with and find which ones that you like for yourself. To use a tool, you click on the subtool that contains it, and then select one of the tools within, and you can start painting. Each tool will have a bunch of settings that you can see here, and even more settings that you can access by clicking this wrench icon. This menu can be a little bit overwhelming, and you don't have to worry about it too much unless you want to modify or make your own brushes, so we won't be covering this today. But just note that you can find many more options for tweaking how each brush looks in here. While you're drawing, if you want to change the brush's size, you can do so down by this brush size panel here. Or what I like to do is I use the open and close bracket keys on my keyboard to really quickly change the brush size. If you're using a tablet pen, it's very likely that the brush's size as well as its opacity, which is another option you can change, will automatically change based on your pen pressure. But if you're using a mouse, it will act as if you're using full pressure with a pen. So you don't get that nice gradient that you might with a tablet pen. Let's talk about the color wheel for a moment. This is the easiest way to pick a color that you want to use on the canvas. There are two modes. There's a mode that looks like a triangle, and there's a mode that looks like a square. I prefer the square because it has a little bit more information on it. You can see with the triangle, you get a whole gamut of white to dark, and you get a whole gamut of black to color and white to color. But this area in the middle here, where it goes from desaturated to saturated, becomes a little bit condensed. So I just like having a little bit more room to select colors in the middle of that spectrum. The ring around the outside will determine the hue. That's the color. So if I want red, I go over to this red area. Or if I want blue, I'll come over to this blue area. In the square configuration, the entire bottom is black and white is in the upper left corner. In the triangle, white is on the top, black is on the bottom, and full saturation is on the right side. If you want to fine-tune, you can double-click the square that's to the bottom left of the color wheel, and you have a lot more options for actively tweaking certain parameters, such as the saturation or the value. There's also a couple of different options like color sliders or palettes, if you want to pick from a palette. I really like these pastels. As well as viewing a history of all of the colors that you've used in your projects so far. Another way to pick colors is with the eyedrop tool. There are two ways to use this tool. The first is pretty simple. It just picks up whatever color is on the canvas currently. The second mode will only pick up a color if it's currently on the layer you have selected. So it's not going to pick up any color from this circle because it's on a different layer. In fact, you'll see it actually picks up transparent color. So if I start drawing, it looks like I'm erasing, but I'm actually drawing with transparent. If you're unsure as to why your brush isn't working, you might have accidentally picked up a transparent color. Just check and see if this has been highlighted. You can use drawing with transparency for interesting effects, 
but it's not something that I typically use. The eyedropper is really useful if you want to pick up a color that you've already used before, but you're not sure exactly what that color is, it'll find that exact color. It's also useful if you want to blend an area, like right here, I want to make a little bit more of a gradation. So I'm going to pick up a color that's in the middle of those two colors and then use it to blend. A faster way to do this is with holding down the Alt key or just by right clicking. You can see if I right click or if I hold down the Alt key, it automatically brings up an eyedrop cursor on the page and I can select a color. I like that Clip Studio in particular has the eyedrop tool linked to the right click because it makes it super easy to right click and then draw and then right click and then draw. If you've made a mark and you want to get rid of it, Clip Studio has a couple of different eraser options. Your standard erasers include hard, soft, kneaded eraser, which is my favorite because it gives you kind of like a texture, like a normal eraser would. It also contains a couple of more advanced eraser options, which I covered in my video on Clip Studio paint tools that you should know. You probably won't need them to start off with, but the most useful of these is this erase on multiple layers, which if you can't find a stray mark or if you want to cut something out from the background, it doesn't matter how many layers you have, it will erase everything. If you have a piece of your artwork that you want to select and cut out or move around, Clip Studio offers a variety of selection tools. The most basic is the rectangle tool. It also offers an ellipse if you want to cut out a circular area and a lasso tool if you need to cut out a very specific shape. The selection pen will let you literally brush over whatever you want to make a selection. And if you mess up, you can use the erase selection tool and undo some of that. This one can be very useful for fine tuning your selections. You can see when I have something selected that I have a toolbar with a bunch of different options on it. Yes, Muffin. This will let you take a number of different actions while you have something selected. The most useful of these is Scale and Rotate. This will let you move the object that you have selected around, resize it if you need to, and rotate it. And then when you have it in the place that you want, you hit OK. Now after you're done scaling and rotating, you still have this object selected. And as you can see, you can only draw inside of a selection. So if you want to continue drawing outside of the dotted lines here, you have to hit this button, which is deselect. Or you can hit Control D on your keyboard to deselect. This will let you continue drawing as you were. Some other useful tools include the bucket tool, which will fill in areas of the same color. So if I try to fill in this transparent background, you can see that it leaves the brush strokes alone because they were a different color than transparent. This is useful for filling in really large areas since it takes a lot less time to click one button than it does to color in by hand. My first step whenever I start a new drawing is to select white on the color wheel and fill in the background white. That way I can draw on a white background instead of this checkerboard which can be a little hard to see on top of sometimes. Clip Studio also has a gradients tool, which is really useful for creating smooth gradients. It has a number of different options as well as the option to download more gradients from the asset store. One of the most useful ones is foreground to transparent. So whichever color you select, it will fade that into a transparent background. The ruler tool can also be a really helpful drawing tool especially if you need to create a straight line, but you have a slightly shaky hand like I do. In addition to straight rulers, Clip Studio also has curved rulers, as well as rulers for different shapes you might need, such as ellipses. What's nice is that Clip Studio is pretty good at telling which ruler you're near, so if you have more than one ruler on one layer, they don't tend to interfere with each other that much. One thing that I want to point out is the difference between the Move Layer option and the Operation tool. 
So the move layer tool will just straight up move everything on the layer that you currently have active. However, if you want to move a particular object, for instance, the rulers, you can move the ruler with the operation tool and the object subtool. So now I've moved all of my rulers into different places and I can draw on them again. Speaking of layers, this is the layers panel. You can see I have two layers, the white background that I created earlier, and a layer with the rulers and all of the drawings that were on top of the rulers. In order to create a new layer, you can hit this button to create a new raster layer, or this button to create a new vector layer. I covered vector layers in my Tools You Should Know video. If you want to delete a layer, you can hit the trash can button, or you can just hit delete on your keyboard. If you have a couple of layers that you want to group together, you can do so by selecting both of them with shift click and hitting control G for group, or by hitting this folder button to create a new folder layer and then dragging them both in. Now you can condense this folder and also hide all of the layers that are inside of it. This is really useful for large projects where you have multiple different layers serving many different purposes. I like to put all of my sketch layers in one folder so that I can hide them all easily and then have my actual drawing in a different folder. Layers also have opacity. So if I want this purple to not be quite as vibrant, I can just turn down the opacity of the layer and then I can also draw underneath of it and you can see that I can see through the purple to this teal that I just created. I actually really like this color scheme. Oh, because it's 90s. Layer opacity can be really useful for shading as well as effects. Speaking of, if you want to achieve some really interesting shading and lighting effects in your artwork, you should play around with blending modes. For instance, if I have a shadow and then perhaps I have a highlight, you can achieve some really cool effects using different blending modes. Like that, which turns the shadow green, which is interesting. Blending modes are ordered based on how they interact with the layer below. So darken all the way down to linear burn will make whatever is on top darker. Lighten all the way down to add glow will make whatever is on top lighter. And these all work in different ways. These are also useful if you just want to change the color of whatever's below. So hue and color will both change whatever that teal is to whatever hue the blue is on the color wheel. Brightness will change this teal to whatever value the blue I put on top was. So these are a lot of different options that are really interesting to explore. They're by no means vital but I encourage you to play with them. So say you're working on a project and you realize you made a mistake a little while ago. You can hit Edit Undo or Control Z on your keyboard, but for instance, say that mistake was made a while ago and you don't want to be mashing Control Z for an hour. In the History tab, you can see every change that you've ever made to this project. Clip Studio will only store so many steps in your history, so you can't go back to the beginning of time unless you just started your project a couple of minutes ago like I did, but this is a quick way to go back to a previous stage of your project before you made the mistake. Or if you've just made a bunch of changes and you want to quickly compare a before and after, this is a quick way to flip back and forth so that you can decide which one you like more. So now you have a beautiful picture and you want to save it. What you should first do is save it as a clip file, which you do by going to File, Save As. And you'll choose the folder, you'll name it, and you'll save it. And then when you close this file, or maybe if your power goes out or something, you can open it again. And the .clip file will save all of your layers so that you can continue working as you were before. But if you finished your image and you want to save it in a format that's able to be shared, you instead want to export. 
Now, if you're working on a comic or an animation, they have options for that, but we're gonna export single layer because that's how most images are shared. If you need to share it with somebody who uses Photoshop, you can export a PSD, although I can't guarantee that will be 100% translated to Photoshop. So if somebody opens it in Photoshop, it might look a little bit different depending on layer blending modes and other effects and such. But for just sharing an image with friends or posting it on the internet, you want to probably use either JPEG or PNG. I prefer PNG because it's a lossless format. JPEG can result in some artifacting, which doesn't look so great. So we're going to save it as a PNG. And then it's going to pop up these export settings. I usually just leave everything as default. Although if you want to scale down or up, you can do so here, or you can specify the exact pixel size when you're exporting it, which can be useful sometimes. And I tend to keep preview render result on output checked because if I uncheck this, for some reason the program crashes. I don't know, maybe that's just me. Maybe you'll have better luck. But when I hit OK, it gives me a preview of what the exported image is going to look like. And now my beautifully shaded circle is saved. Now, the last thing that I want to touch on, I said I would touch on earlier, is browsing the asset store. You can find the asset store by hitting this green icon, Clip Studio Assets, or also in your web browser. The asset store has tons of different materials, not just brushes, but also 3D models, textures, etc. Some of them are paid with either clippy points or with gold, but a lot of them are free. So let's download a brush. I'm interested in these slash effect brushes. They're apparently free for 48 hours, and I can't say no to that. So for a free asset, all you do is hit download. And it'll pop up. The material has been downloaded. Now you'll see up here there's a little icon. Communications manager says it's still downloading, so we're going to wait until that's done. Oh, these are really cool, but I don't have any clippy. Not me enrolling in gold membership so that I could buy those cyberpunk brushes. If you want to buy a paid asset, just make sure you have enough Clippy or gold in your account, whichever one it uses, and it's the same process. You just check out now. Get with 60 Clippy tokens. The material has been downloaded. So now that you've purchased or downloaded those brushes, how do you use them? Well, if you click these two little icons here, or if you open the materials panel, you can actually just see them in the downloads folder. The materials panel is where all of your brushes are stored. It can get a little bit crazy if you uh, haven't put them into folders like I haven't, but all you do is grab the material and pop it into your subfolder from before. I'm actually going to make a new subfolder for this. I'm going to call this subfolder slashing. All of the 48 hour free ones that I downloaded are going to go into that new subtool. And then the cyberpunk ones are automatically going to get added to the whichever subtool I already have selected, but then I can just drag it out into its own new one. And I'm going to put all of the cyberpunk bundle in here. And that's how you download and use materials. So those are the basic features of Clip Studio Paint. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below and make sure you're subscribed so that you don't miss any videos in the future. I have a few more Clip Studio Paint videos planned, including another advanced tools you should know, as well as a comparison between Pro and EX. Now that you have a basic handle on Clip Studio Paint, you should check out my video on 11 tools you should know. I'll see you over there. Till then, take care.